Hello and welcome to our show. Today we're talking about love triangles. I'm Erica and my favorite triangle couple in literature is the book Christie by Catherine Marshall. Literature. It would have been good to pick literature. Oh, you <laughs> and uh, one of my favorite couples is from the Adams family. I hope to have the deep love those two characters do in my later years. Ah, uh, Gomez. Uh, I'm Cameron. Uh, I, I honestly couldn't even identify a favorite love triangle for you because I, I don't like them. But uh, my one of my favorite uh, couples and, and romantic uh, relationships actually comes from a book that probably not a ton of folks have read. It's uh, Orson Scott Card's retelling of the Sleeping Beauty story, Enchantment. Uh, and I can't even remember the names of the folks at this point, but that, that pairing and the way he describes their relationship. Awesome. Ivan Booth and Princess Lady. I don't know Princess Thank Lady's name. Thank you, Ivan. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. It's been too long since I've read it. Right. Well, um, I don't know about literature, but I'm Jonah, and probably my favorite relationship is actually a real life Adams family, which is John and Abigail Adams. Just. <laughs> Yes. Everything about the relationship is goals, regardless of the gender of either participant. Um, my name's Mari, and if we're doing literary couples, I think my favorite would be Eleanor and Edmund from Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. Nice. They're just absolutely awkward and adorable. And my name's Mason. And honestly, until about five seconds ago, I didn't have an answer and was desperately thinking about one. But the answer that I'm going to give you in order to give an answer is uh, Vin and Ellen from Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series. Mason, you nerd. <laughs> what can I say? Golly gee, that's me. I feel like that's a nice one. I know my wife particularly likes that one because you get to see a married couple or like, you know, a couple stay together for a period of time. Um, where oftentimes, you know, a lot of stories seem to rely on the will they, won't they? Yeah. Uh, those are getting to see like a successful couple go through sort of the hurdles of staying a couple together. Um, and I feel like that's a, that is a cool part of that one for sure. Absolutely. 100% agree. All right. So we're excited to talk with you on love triangles today and why we love them and why we hate them and how you can write one better. So I have this split up into six types of love triangles. We're each taking one and I have this split up into three that are based on fate and three that are based on communication. So I'm going to kick it off with what I think most people think of when they think of love triangles. Although I think this is one of the more rare types in fiction of any type. And I call it the equilateral triangle. This is where Bob loves Alice and he loves Carol and you don't know which one he's going to end up with. So your fans are splitting themselves into Team Alice and Team Carol and all the Team Carol fans and you hate Mel at the end and they like to kill you because Alice won out. And the tension here comes from the audience not knowing who he's going to choose. And up until the last act, act of the book, it really could go either way. This is the most controversial love triangle, but it's also the most plot worthy. And why I love this one is because you can take the theme or the plot, you can represent it in the forms of people. So if you're writing a book about war and your theme is loyalty, then you can have a lover on both sides of the conflict. So then when your character is choosing which person they're going to end up with, they're not choosing romance, they're really picking a side in the war. Or if you have a small town romance about a kid who's grown up on the farm and he wants to go to college, then you can split between the girl next door on another farm and the big city college girl. So it's not really just that he's picking the girl, it's he's picking what he, what he wants to do with his life and what kind of fate he's picking for himself. And the tension here, like I said before, really comes from you not knowing where they're going to, going to end up and it's going to set them on two completely different paths. But there's another type of love triangle that I think is the most common that I call the decoy. And this is where you have Bob and he's in a relationship with Alice, it's clear that He's going to end up, with, end up with her at the end, but Carol comes along as a decoy. And this can range from Carol's a distraction or at worst, Carol's a villain. And Mari, you have some decoys you want to talk about. Oh, I, yeah, I've got too many decoys I want to talk about. But I think the, um, the dramatic irony behind the decoy dramatic irony is when the reader knows something that the character doesn't. A lot of the dramatic irony behind the decoy is that if you are engaged in a lot of romantic stories, there are specific... Um, 
like rhetorical techniques or moves a story makes that will incline to you which character they, they should end up with. So it's not just based in character morality. Um, I don't know if this can be a cause for discussion. Not like you pick the better person, it's based on how this story is growing, um, who are they going to end up with? I think a good example of that that um, Erica listed um, was in Frozen, where you've got Hans and you've got Kristoff. And Hans is initially presented as the, uh, um, as the character that fits the stereotypical um, expectations of who she's going to end up with. Um, but then as she goes, as Anna goes on a journey with Kristoff and they start to spend time together and they start to banter together, um, you start to pick up on a, a couple of rhetorical strategies you usually see in a romance. Um, for example, the banter, the time spent together, the, the longing looks. Um, and so the, as an audience member, by the time she goes back to Hans, you're like, no, she's supposed to end up with him. Um, I, in some point, as an audience member, um, I'm conditioned to think that she should end up with Kristoff because they're meeting these specific um, tropes that, that, that lead to them being a romance. Erica, you can disagree with me. If anyone can disagree with me, if they think that this um this isn't a technique uh, but at least for me like uh, another example i thought of was um twilight which initially presents mm. itself yeah which I, really itself. you keep yes. going really so it initially presents itself hear me out because erica just said that like the teams and so we had the team edward and team jacob shirts um and i read twilight i don't know how many times as a teenager um, but there's this really interesting point in the third book where um, Bella's having a conversation with Jacob and she tells Jacob, don't make me choose because if you make me choose, it will always be him. Um, and that kind of sentiment carries throughout the second and the third book as well when you look at Bella's specific decisions in the story. Um, so even though it seems, especially at the beginning, to be like an equilateral, is she going to pick the vampire or is she going to pick the, uh, the werewolf? She's basically decided. Um, and so uh, Jacob is at best an obstacle to her reaching Jacob and to her reaching Edward and at worst a villain getting in her way for her to achieve the goal that she's already decided. Um, and the goal that she decided is based off of tropes that we can see in terms of a classic romance. I'm seeing a lot of people who look like they're disagreeing, so. No, I don't necessarily disagree. I, I, I was gonna ask a question before you brought up the Twilight example, which was, Sorry that I know that it's good because it's a counter example. And, and, and so it's making me think about it. Um, my understanding of the decoy is that the decoy love interest is always going to be the more socially acceptable one. The one that uh, if they're smart, they'll pick, but it's it, it, when you talk about Edward and Jacob, Jacob doesn't necessarily fit into that mold very well. Um, it's, I'm thinking specifically in terms of social class, where uh, Edward is obviously the richer one. And I mean, you can get into all sorts of uh, stuff there, but um, does that usually hold true or am I just inexperienced as a love triangle aficionado? I don't know. Is... Oh, go um, ahead. Well, I don't know because one of the most I don't imagine it's like the most famous decoy love triangle, but one of the more well-known ones that my brain goes to is actually Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Collins, because like Collins is obviously just an obstacle. Obstacle. The reader knows going in that Elizabeth is never going to pick Collins, but she's not turning him down because he's less prestigious or less genteel, but it's because she doesn't love him. And Obviously, there's, there's different context between a decision based on social class and a decision based on emotion. But from in a vacuum, I would imagine that there can be just as much an aspect of emotion to the decision between a decoy and the real one as there can be just social pressure. So maybe Jonah, the decoy... Up... Go ahead, go ahead. Jonah, when you, th you brought up Pride and Prejudice, I thought we were going to talk about Wickham, which, which fair point with Collins there, but... I think Wickham and Hans kind of encapsulate what makes a decoy a decoy, and Jacob too, in that you can tell who she's going to end up with fairly early on after she spent time with both love interests, and in every case, Anna and Bella and Elizabeth, and, and in Jacob in particular, 
my entire middle school was team was team Jacob. I think we had one team Edward sweatshirt in the entire school. And and I think it's important that there's two types of decoys. There's the one where the audience wants wants the more desirable one to win out in the case of Jacob. And then there's the kind where it does escalate into the as with Wickham and with Hans and Frozen. So I gotta ask a question. Is a decoy then just a poorly done love triangle? Because <laughs> to me, at least, what we're really talking about is how obvious the writer is making the main character's intentions. So like in a decoy, we call them a decoy because we know that that person isn't gonna be picked because it's been made clear that the person, the main character doesn't love this decoy or loves the other person too much, so on and so forth. But to me that devalues the potential tension or conflict in the story. And it seems like if we knew more about the decoy that we would, uh, you know, if we knew enough about them, maybe we would want to be on their team and then that would create a more interesting read because then we'd be wondering what's happening. So I'm wondering like, is there actual value in writing a decoy, like choosing to write a decoy? overwriting our traditional love triangle. I'd say so because I think a decoy signals to your fandom who you're going to, have to put up with in the end. In a real collateral, you don't really know until the end, so people become more entrenched in their teams, but in a decoy, you know, okay, I can like Team Jacob, but I've understood since the first book of the Twilight Saga that she's going to end up with Edward. Jacob's just someone fun to root for in the meantime. Um, and I think, oh, go ahead, Mason, sorry. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. No worries. Um, ooh, brain, don't fail me now. Um, I can go ahead really quick. So you I go. I transition to your thought. Um, I think another um, aspect of utility for a decoy is that usually the decoy character is a foil to the initial love interest. Like you look at Edward and Jacob, one's extroverted, one's introverted, one's warm, one's cold. Um, and when you look at the example of Cough, Cough, Boys Over Flowers, the K-drama, um, the, the primary love interest is deeply flawed, whereas the decoy um, is, is loving and is caring. And throughout the uh, show, um, the primary love interest takes on the attributes of the decoy. Um, and so in order to become a full, um, efficient person who knows how to love, they need to take the decoy's attributes and put them upon themselves. And so I think there is some learning between the two of them. I feel like we're using decoy and love triangle then interchangeably because it feels like people kind of move in and out from being decoys or not because boys are flowers again would feel like a, a true love triangle like I would say that uh, Twilight feels. It's just perhaps over time as we learn more about the characters or the direction then someone becomes like more of a decoy as it becomes more obvious what the main character is going to do. But Mason, it looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, firstly, like, I think that the greatest asset of the decoy is literary irony, right? In which the reader knows something, um, and the, uh, like, actual character, the participant in the story itself does not. Um, I hope, I'm fairly certain that's what literary irony is. I hope that the internet does not get after me for it being something else. Um, but I would say personally, I think that's like the asset that the decoy has available to it that no other triangle has, um, at least as far as I could think. Um, so I would say like that is kind of the one thing. Now, whether or not you think that's worthy of making the decoy your love triangle is an entirely different conversation, right? Like, I don't know if necessarily making an entire B-plot in your story focus around literary irony is necessarily um, the most compelling thing. Um, but I could definitely be off on that. I could be wrong, so. Thank you, Mason. Yeah, I, oh, I was just gonna say, if, uh, unless someone else has something to say about the decoy, this is actually kind of a good transition into my triangle, the Eponine. The reason that I was surprised when Mari was like, and Twilight is the decoy, was because Twilight, I thought, was an Eponine triangle. Um, now, I guess maybe this whole video will be us talking about what exactly Twilight is. Um, personally, I don't know about that. But anyways. <laughs> Um, the general structure of the Eponine is the following. Bob loves Alice. Uh, Carol loves Bob, but 
uh, suck a lemon, Carol. You're not going to get it. Um, it is the sad love triangle. It is named after uh, probably one of the more visceral um, Eponine love triangles in history with uh, Marius, Cosette, and Eponine, right? Where Eponine continuously pines um, and in the end just kind of dies. Uh, a generally unloved person. Um, in a similar vein, uh, Jonah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, in a similar vein, we get Twilight, right? Uh, where Jacob's constantly attempting, Jacob's constantly trying to do stuff. Um, and in the end, it doesn't really matter because Bella's always going to end up with Edward. Um, that's, that's my argument. Uh, we could, we could debate that. Also, um, if, if we want to look to uh, one of the most vanilla TV shows in all of the 90s, Friends, uh, the whole weird Joey uh, plot where like J Joey liked Rachel for a while. Uh, that's, that's another example. Hopefully most of you groaned when I said that. Um, but if you didn't, I apologize for insulting a TV show that I guess you like. Never should have happened. Never should have happened. <laughs> so is the distinction between the Eponine then and the, and the decoy just the, the level of tragedy involved? The level of uh, you suck and you will never be loved? I, I, yeah. I think on some level, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say, I feel like it's if the reader cares about the decoy, right? Because like the decoy is never going to get into the triangle for real, right? Like the decoy is never going to get the real relationship. Um, and so it's like, if you feel bad for the decoy, then it kind of becomes this, because I think a lot of Team Jacob was like, Jacob, we are amazing. Poor Jacob, poor Jacob. <laughs> I'll take Jacob. So, like, I, do, I do feel like there is that sorrow for Jacob from the Team Jacob crew. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying that I, I think this is necessarily fully embodying, because I think he did have a chance. But if decoy does seem to go into the eponine, to me at least. Well, this is sort a question of. I want to shoot at Erica, if that's OK. Um, for, for the Eponine triangle, is Eponine required, the Eponine character required to have a tragic ending? I don't think necessarily. I think the distinction with an Eponine is, you know, you can never pretend to root for the Eponine character. Like the decoy, you can kick yourself into belie believing that the character has a chance. With the Eponine, you really can't. The eternal the friend zone, friend zone. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well... The to be fair, zone. it doesn't it, to be fair, it doesn't zone. necessarily have to be the friend zone, as far as I think, because, and I think this is more a variation on it than a true done and done stereotypical eponym. But if you think about the ending of something like La La Land, like sure. I would read Emma Stone's character as the eponym in this scenario, either either Emma Stone or. Gosh, I'm Ryan Gosling. his name. I, Ryan Gosling, thank you. I could I not say that. Ryan Gosling, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. either either one of them, they don't end up together at the end. Spoilers, I'm sorry, but it's been out for several years and you should have watched it by now. But they don't end up together at the end and at the end, Emma Stone is with someone else. And there's that bit like. of tragic ending there because you've been rooting for both of them and they don't end up together. But there's also the satisfaction of knowing that neither of them is torn up about it. Which is why I call it a variation on the eponym because, you know, Emma Stone didn't die while singing A Little Fall of Rain at the yeah. end of La La Land. They yeah. had that nice yeah. little fantasy scene instead, but still. Yeah, maybe that's it, is that we actually root for Eponine. But, like, I don't give a dang when, when Hans ends up, like, going off and kicking a brick because he should, because he sucks. Punched into the harbor. It's funny, talking about La La Land, despite my feelings about that film, made me think of uh, <laughs> the You've Got Mail situation, which I always thought was a really nice uh, breakup that happens between uh, Meg Ryan and I, uh, I can't think of the other guy's name, even though he's a phenomenal actor. Um, they break up, but we're, we're excited for them. Like it's, it's a quasi love triangle because she's realizing that she cares about Tom Hanks and she breaks up with the person she's with. but. They both do it in this way that it's it's good for both of them. So you're like happy for this this movement of the triangle. So not, not, not exactly the same, but you know, people deciding they're not going to be together and it being a good thing as opposed to a sad thing. So it feels like it would just be sort of the opposite of the 
happening to a degree. Greg Kinnear is the yeah. actor's name. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I just well, need to wrap. I just need to wrap up the Eponine by saying the Eponine is the friend zone with a bullet. The friend zone in the end zone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So those three love triangles we talked about are all based on the ending on who they end up with. These the other three I want to talk about are all based on communication. And I'm going to kick, off, kick it off my least favorite type of love triangle, the one that doesn't exist. This is the imaginary love triangle where Alice and Bob are dating. They're very happy together. And to add conflict, Alice mistakenly thinks Bob likes Carol. And I really think this is annoying if it's used long term. There is a Roger Ebert quote that says, in any movie where the heroine catches her boyfriend dancing in public with another woman and makes a big scene, the other woman invariably turns out to be the boyfriend's sister. This is a subset of a trope that I just hate to death, which is the lack of communication between characters. If your movie could end in five minutes, if someone would just get on their cell phone, don't make the movie, right? Don't write the book, whatever it is. Um, and this is sort of the imaginary love triangle is the perfect iteration of this or, or a great example of this, where if you, it, it, it's all based in misunderstanding and in uh, not talking it out. When in reality, it's like, oh, you're, you're, you're dancing with another woman. If I actually care about you, if I actually like you, I am probably going to talk to you about that. And the various reasons that uh, rom-coms and, and other uh, iterations of the imaginary love tri triangle use invariably strike me as contrived uh, because there's really, if, if, you're, if you're heavily invested in a relationship, especially early on, you will probably cut off your own thumbs to resolve an issue. And so, uh, you know, my cell phone's dead or uh, I, you know, I, 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 I just got uh, dental work done and so my tongue's swollen or whatever. I, I don't care. Like, you're going to go and have that conversation even if it's awkward, but for some reason in these stories, they don't. And voila, you have tension that bothers me and then I stop watching and my kids keep watching because they love this. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite going to be devil's advocate on this because I agree with you 100%, but there is a scale of context sure. that you can add to kind of make it better. Like I think of the difference between, and honestly the best examples of the imaginary love triangles are honestly the ones that only last a few minutes. Like the conflict is there, you get a quick emotional punch of tension and then it's resolved but there's still a good and a bad way to do this. And the good way to do this, if there is one, is probably how Enchanted does it. Because you have the scene where Adina Menzel walks into the apartment and she sees, you know, Giselle and what's his name on the floor, she's in a towel. Like there is honestly, there are obviously assumptions that are going to be made and they're very reasonable assumptions given the fact that it's Amy Adams in a towel. <laughs> and so you can, to an extent, understand why she would just storm out in a huff instead of going, what are you two doing on the floor of the apartment as if you're about to bang? But the bad way to do this is in something like I thought this Hitch. Was a Disney movie. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a Disney movie too. But in something like Hitch, where at the very end, Will Smith goes to Love Interest's apartment and he's making this huge scene and she opens the door and there's a guy standing next to her and she has every opportunity to explain that this is her brother-in-law and she doesn't. She just goes, Alex Hitchens meets so-and-so. And so you can understand why Will Smith would immediately assume that this guy is a rival love interest. That's not on him. The fault, but there is an entirely contrived fault on her end because she had every opportunity to explain who this guy actually was and for some reason didn't. So even, even within these short emotional punches, there's still a level of technique and context that you can achieve. Yeah, and the long and short of it for me is if you have to get your characters to act out of character in order to prolong the tension, find another way to do it. I think it's easy to fall into what's easy. Right, you know, the idea that when you're writing something, you're like, oh, I want, I, I want this to happen. I feel the story should have this. And then you manufacture it. It's, it's not gonna, it's, you're the people who are watching, the people who are reading, you're gonna feel that to a degree. And so it's just trying to avoid those situations as, as tempting as they can be, you know? Yeah, yeah I, I think... would, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, 
when you, especially when you're dealing with uh, emotional matters, uh, when you're writing, you've got to let your characters lead you as you've established them so far, instead of your desires for plot uh, leading the characters. Yeah, this triangle rests entirely on people not communicating for dumb reasons. I think it's a good contrast to the next kind of triangle I want to talk about, which is what I like to call a real love triangle, where people don't communicate for, for very good reasons. And the one I'm going to use as the example of this is Twelfth Night, where Viola is disguised as a boy, and the, ent the entire frame of the love triangle is built around everybody not knowing her true gender. And so this is where Bob loves Alice, but Alice is secretly Alvin, who loves Carol, who loves Bob. And this is played for laughs sometimes, it plays for drama, and I call it a real love triangle because you get all the sides and it completes itself. Everybody loves and is loved by somebody. And you usually see this as a subplot. Twelfth Night is the only one I can think of where it really builds the whole story. And that love triangle is mine. So I'm going to talk about why I love this one so much. And first off, Erica, how dare you use such mundane names as Bob and Alice when we have perfectly viable Shakespearean names like Orsino and Viola. But anyway, the reason I love this one is because what Erica says, it's the true triangle. And my dear autistic spectrum brain just loves it when tr love triangles are actually triangles. But... The great thing about this one is that it's often used for comedic purposes. Like if you look at Twelfth Night, there are so many laughs whenever Olivia is wooing Cesario and then everyone knows that Cesario is actually another woman. But there's actually a level of context and often social critique that you can do with this because it's examining the nuances of gender roles and such as it's examining what happens if, what if a woman is perceived as a man. And in, Erica's right, it's usually a subplot. Twelfth Night is, you know, the most famous overarching one where it's the whole plot. But a lot of the times it's used just as quick laughs. And that's the, that's the nuance that you need to avoid. Because if you're using this as a subplot, and especially if you're using this for a comedic one, you need to understand the distinction between gender critique for comedy and transphobia for comedy. Because if you've got the Twelfth Night distinction of everyone knows that she's a woman, but she's getting wooed by another woman, that's great. It's hilarious. But the thing about Twelfth Night is that when Viola is presenting as Viola and when Viola is presenting as Cesario, the other characters respect her the same way. Like when Viola is, you know, in Duke Orsino's court as a woman, she's respected as such. And when she is Cesario, she is respected as Cesario. But if you have a true love triangle in which the gender can, I'm not gonna say gender confused, that's not the thing to say. When you have the, ambigu the gender ambiguous character being treated or evaluated differently because they're passing as one gender over the other and you are using that for comedy, that is transphobia and you need to avoid that. And thanks but, for referencing, oh, sorry. No, 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 I was, I was gonna move on to something else, so. And thanks for referencing gender there because I think a lot of people assume that love triangles have to be built around women. And I think you can do a very viable love triangle with a woman split between two men or any other way that, that you want to frame the love triangle. And sad to say, I think the reason love triangles attract a lot of criticism is because they are woman-centric. And I do think there's a level of sexism there that people think that a woman wouldn't be attractive to two different men and wouldn't be able to maintain both of their affections at the same time. So thank you for bringing up gender there. I actually, yeah. want, to touch, I actually want to touch on that for a second because that's something that I'm, I'm... When I think of love triangles, what I think of is one woman being pursued by two men. Um, I have a much more difficult time coming up with examples of uh, one man being pursued by two women. I think that is because of the, uh, the socialization uh, in our society of men expected to be the active ones in romance, um, whereas 
it just hits differently, it feels like, especially when you're talking about hetero romance. Um, a, a guy who is interested in two girls and can't decide, decide between them, that is someone who is assumed to already have the power. So he ends up just looking like a jerk because he's leading somebody on who he's not going to pick. Whereas the societal assumption that the woman when she is pursued by two men has a level of power of choice that she is not normally assumed to have in our society makes that a more interesting dynamic on average. Now, uh, maybe I just am inexperienced with love triangles and I'm just missing a whole host of, you know, guy in the center with two girls, but does that seem fair to generalize in terms of the power dynamics between genders that way? I think the distinction that needs to be made is the fact that when you have a guy with two girls, or yeah, yeah, if you, if you have a guy with two girls, most people wouldn't call that a love triangle. Like most people would call that just a guy just being dude. lucky or something. <laughs> like, and no, right. honestly, like if you, if you look at a lot of high school stories, both from actual high school experiences and in literature, when you have a guy with multiple girls pursuing, you have the Gaston effect. Like no one would look at Gaston and the three girls in the opening number lusting after him. You wouldn't call that a love triangle for many reasons. But, you, but even if you have just that, in, that instance of a guy being pursued by multiple girls, you would just say that that guy's getting some action, which is frankly highly horrifying to think of, of how prevalent it is. Yeah. But the best, the best way that I can think of for actually breaking away from this is actually something that I've done in my novel, which is, you know, have a non-heteronormative love triangle which is actually polyamorous. And I wanted to talk about that really quickly, which is just that polyamory is a variation on the true love triangle in which a choice is not made, in which you have the instance of someone who loves the person. It, it normally happens that there's a character in the center. You have one person loves them, one person loves another one. And there is some sort of camaraderie or friendship between the final two. At least that's how I understand it. And the way that I actually wrote that was my main character in the center was male. He has a relationship with a woman and he has a relationship with a man and that man and that woman are friends. I give them a whole scene together to make sure that people don't think that they are only connected by this guy in the middle. But I just, when I was writing that, it was actually difficult for me to think that it was working properly because the kinds of love triangles that I had seen were so frequently just the person in the center has two people of the opposite gender who they need to make a decision between. And so being able to write a polyamorous relationship and making it queer was actually really important. And I think that's something that should be brought up just so that people can understand that that's something you can and if you want to, should do. I think there's a lot of, uh, sorry, go ahead, Mai. Um, and I, sorry, I, I've also been talking a lot. I've just been quiet for the past 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> I, I, think to, um, I think to that point, um, looking at the market, we're seeing more polyamorous and LGBTQ um, relationships being published by, by major, um, like the big five publishing companies. And I think I'm going to be the cynic here. Um, I frankly think the construction of the, um, of the love triangle where there's a woman and two guys, when you look at the um, heteronormative heteronormative version is because it's um it, it's the anticipated market like it, it's the belief that romance is only for for a woman to to particularly enjoy within a story um and that romance first off has to be heteronormative um and then second um what's it called it has to be some level of wish fulfillment um where a woman um earns a happy ending or or they earn a level of happiness by deciding between two men and finding one that can give them a better socioeconomic position where you see that in pride and prejudice or or in eternal life as you can see in twilight or or something that's generally better and the only way a woman could hypothetically earn that is through some level of a relationship which i think is a bit antiquated um and so to jonah's point i'm really excited about seeing different kinds of um representation in terms of modern love triangles um, as it's more reflective of, um, of a more modern society instead of going back to the idea that a woman needs a man in order to find happiness. That's uh, oh, sorry, Maria, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, I'm done. Great. I, I can start scatting, but I think that's all I have to say. <laughs>
No need. No need for that. I was just going to jump off of that if I could and say that I think another kind of dynamic and problematic element of this um, isn't necessarily gendered, but maybe a little bit more psychological in that it assumes that anyone needs anyone else in order to be whole, right? Um, like whether they're male, whether they're female, whether they're non-binary, what have you, right? Like um, in order for the a uh, female character to be happy, she has to pick between the two males. In order for the males to be happy, they have to be picked by the female, right? Um, whereas, like, why, why can't they all just be okay without anyone picking anyone? Um, which is why historic. I mean, among other things, historically speaking, I haven't been the hugest fan of of romantic triangles for that reason. Um, but yeah, I think that is another element in that, like, no matter gender, no matter, like, uh, monogamy, polyamory, what have you, there is also this baked in assumption into love triangles that, like, anyone must be chosen in order to be whole or feel okay about themselves or have a happy ending. However, you are challenging one of the basic promises of the, the romance genre when you start talking in that uh, sure. direction, sure. where, I mean, the reason people are buying the book is to get some some romantic uh, satisfaction out of it. And if where we end up is, you know what, maybe I am okay and I'm just gonna go have a glass of wine and a bath. Um, I, I, not that that can't be a satisfying place yeah. to end for, for some stories, but I think when you start moving into the romance realm, you're gonna get some. You're gonna get some letter bombs there. Sure, 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 sure. Which is why probably the take that I'm having is like probably better with subplot triangles or what have you, right? Yeah. As opposed to like main romance. Anyways. Well, I think also probably the treatment I gave the concept of the love triangle was a bit in the concept of a, a general romance genre where you start off with a lonely person they end up married by the end and usually when you see a romance like that it's like the uh, the marriage or getting together at the end seems to be the goal but i think to give more justice to the romance genre and to point out the uh, couple you picked mason um with vin and ellen is that often a romance can continue beyond earning someone, but rather yeah. enjoying the happiness, working through the struggle together and finding a happily ever after beyond just pursuing another person. Yeah. Uh, Erica, as you are the expert, I don't know if that's where we want it to go, but that's what I was thinking. No, I like it. I think this love triangle ultimately goes back to communication again, because it depends on everybody understanding everything they need to know about the other person, the gender, the sexuality, the overall expectations of the structure of what a relationship can take. And another major love triangle where people have a very good reason not to communicate is the two-person love triangle. And you see this a lot in superhero media. This is where Bob loves Alice, but Alice is super Carol. They're <laughs> one and the same, but Bob can't know that. And then the classic textbook example of this is Lois Lane and Clark Kent and Superman, all three of them. A couple quick comments about the past. Um, well, I do agree. There is obviously a lot to talk about in terms of uh, these sort of <laughs> expectations that are built into romances. I do think that uh, having another potential person that someone could fall in love with is, is a natural thing to put in that sort of story because most stories do have some sort of conflict in them. And so it's, it's natural if your primary story is going to be about two people, do they end up together? Obviously, there can be many hurdles that could be placed with them. But uh, when it comes to, you know, a sort of a normal conflict to have, it is to have that extra person in there. So, like, I do understand that at this point, like, having, you know, so many uh, of these various love triangles in existence in various stories, we can be like, oh, there's so many. But I also do think it's, like, pretty uh, standard. Um, so, when it comes to uh, this particular love triangle, the uh, reason that I want to talk about it was a couple things. Uh, one is that uh, when it comes to sort of this two-person love triangle, as uh, was already said by Erica, it is pretty standard, or at least I feel like it used to be more standard. I feel like it's not used as much now. I feel like now that we're in this realm of like grittier superheroes, uh, you know, with like Dark Knight back in the day, and more recently like Boys or something, 
the idea that a character could simply take off their glasses and you know oh who are they now like i didn't know um it, it doesn't that sort of smacks in the face of, of what we're doing now like no we're real superheroes we're dealing with real consequences if someone's super fast they could run through someone accidentally you know stuff like that and so i feel like we're not getting it as much now and i think i think that is a shame because i think there's this really cool moment that gets to happen, very particular scenes you get to have in the type of story where it is this two person love triangle where someone also has an alternate identity. And what I'm referring to is when you have the sort of regular version of the person, normal Carol, we'll say, not super Carol, she gets to see a different side to the love interest than she gets to see as super Carol. Now, true, it's maybe not the side that you know, she wants to get to see, but she gets to see more about that character. And we as viewers or readers, we get to know something that the audience, that the uh, characters in the story do not. And it's, it's always fun as a reader when you're aware of something that the people in the story aren't yet. And you're like cheering on for them to figure it out, or you're wondering when is the moment that they're going to figure it out. And I feel like this can create a lot of fun tension where, you know, you're watching a scene between you know, Bob and, and regular Carol, and you're like, but regular Carol's a regular Carol. Um, I constantly think of, though I, I deeply love uh, Lois and Clark, um, I, I absolutely love that show. I constantly think of Christopher Reeves, and there's a amazing quick gif of Christopher Reeves, you know, becoming Superman as he watches Lois Lane, like walk down the hallway, where, and I'm talking the Superman movies here, where he's like a little hunched, a little slouched, and he just sort of straightens, takes his glasses off and it's like, boom, you believe. You're like, oh yeah, no, there's a reason why you could see these two people next to each other. You would not know that one is Superman and one is not. And I think the really fun thing that also that happens in that movie and the way Chris Reeves plays it is he has kind of fun being the regular person and the other person not knowing. Because I think a lot of times when we think of this sort of love triangle, we think of the, the super person in agony of like, oh, if only they could love me as regular me. And, you know, I, and now I've got, I can't tell them my secret because then they'd be in danger. And yeah, that's all true. But there's this opportunity to, to mess with the other person, to have, to have fun or again, learn more about them. So I just think there's a lot of opportunities um, in this love triangle. And what I love about us even talking about these love triangles uh, it's definitely got me thinking like, why aren't I thinking about all these more? <laughs> I'm writing like, you know, even talk about this. I'm like, I got to do this in my next book. This sounds like so much fun. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's my thoughts on that particular love triangle and the opportunities to have a reader know something that your characters don't, or at least one character doesn't, and how fun that can be, and the way you can play uh, with those moments. Obviously, we don't have the same sort of visual things in a book that we would in a movie, but I think, you know, crafting that and selling those differences uh, are part of the, the fun. Why, why the person doesn't recognize the superhero and like, you know, making that believable. Obviously, that's tricky to, to make it believable because you don't want to make the love interest stupid. <laughs> They're just so foolish they don't understand that the person is different. Um, but I think that's part of the challenge that makes it worthwhile to do. Yeah. If, if I could just really quick go off of that, I do think that the, uh, the two-person triangle, the superhero triangle, does play and does utilize some of the strengths that we've already touched on earlier. Like Jeff said, you've got the, you've got the literary irony um, in so far as like readers know something, characters don't. Uh, but also like with our uh, earlier kind of imaginary love triangle discussion, Cameron talking about how like, uh, if only they would communicate, right? This is a love triangle that forces people into a lack of communication, right? Peter Parker can't say anything to Mary Jane because she said something to Spider-Man, not to Peter Parker. Um, and so like the two person triangle, uh, I think pulls off what the imaginary love triangle can't because of this forced miscommunication and also has again what i think may be the only strength of the decoy uh namely this sort of dramatic irony as well of um of one character not having the full picture while we the reader do um so i think i personally like i get why i love superheroes i get why a lot of superhero comics have moved away from this 
Uh, Mary Jane knows Spider-Man's Peter. She's known for a while now. Um, same with Lois, same with Superman. Um, and there's just a whole host of other reasons why we, I think comic books and superhero stuff has moved past this. But I do think it is a little bit of a bummer because I think it's one of the uh, love triangles that has the fewest number of weaknesses and the greatest number of strengths. The most recent example I can think of this one is actually a kids TV show called uh, Mysterious Ladybug and Cat Noir, where mm. they actually double down on it, where both the guy and the girl have secret identities and are in love with the super powered other. That's great. And it's great. It's a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's awesome too, because like also this triangle is another one that often gets gendered, right? Yeah, like right. the male usually is the one with the two identities and then the female is usually a fan of the superhero and not a fan of the other. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's an awesome way of kind of uh, dodging that bullet, so to speak. Yeah. But I think it works with the communication because there's, it feels like there's more of a legitimate reason why that communication can't happen. Especially if it's literally like, I've got people who are after me that want to kill me, so I can't tell you who I really am, you know? So I think it, it, it succeeds by having that sort of aspect to it. Absolutely. All right, well, thanks for tuning in. This has been great. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.